we are going to hear, first of all, from Scott Cowan from Veritas, then John Frankel from Frankel's Forensics. It sounds actually like one of these mints, doesn't it? <laughs> Fergal's Frankel's Fernargos, I can't even pronounce it. And then Mark Garnier uh, will give a political perspective. We'll then hear three case studies of people who have been victims of this mis-selling. They'll just give short presentations of what happened uh, to them. And then I'm going to invite up onto the stage two other people to join us, Mike Cherry, who is uh, the policy chairman of the FSB, uh, Representative Federation of Small Businesses, and Caroline Wyman, the legal director and principal ombudsman at the Financial Ombudsman Service. Uh, it is a, a huge surprise to me that there's nobody here on the panel from the banks. <laughs> and I just can't think why that should be. So let's get things off. Let's begin with our first president. And then, of course, after we've done that, we'll throw it, throw it open. We've got microphones around the room, and we'll get your questions as well. So to kick things off, let's hear from a man who's been really deeply involved in this, uh, navigating uh, on behalf of his clients the FCA review process to try and get them the maximum compensation for missold interest rate hedging products. He is the director of Veritas Treasury. Please welcome Scott Kahn. Thank you, Andrew. Good evening. I actually have a bit of a bad feeling about this. Um, before the debate, Andrew said that he was going to start with a joke, and he's just introduced me. Um, <laughs> on behalf of Veritas, I would like to welcome you to the Landmark Hotel and to what I hope will be a very constructive, constructive evening. My name is uh, Scott Cowan. I'm a director at Veritas Treasury. Veritas advises clients on a wide range of banking-related matters, and my area of specialisation is interest rate hedging. I have over 20 years of banking experience and was latterly head of Treasury sales at a UK-based bank. And it tells me here to wait until the booze stop. Right. Okay. I'd like to give you an overview of where we are in the FCA process and share some real-life experiences of a cross-section of our clients, some of whom are here tonight. Most of you will know, be familiar with the figures of the review. Um, you know, 80, over 18,000 people, non-customers, non-sophisticated. The bad news, in my view, there's 10,500 that are sophisticated and excluded from the review. That's the number of outcomes and the offers accepted. So I think it's fair to say we're at half time in this process. Where it goes next, who knows? One thing I would like to draw your attention to, and just pause on for a moment, the, is the increase in the use of alternative products. This represented 33% of outcomes communicated according to the FCA February figures. In my view, this will continue to rise, and I think it should be watched very carefully, as, a, as it has a major effect on the amount of redress due to victims. This slide here highlights how the review is far from perfect. Both customers were sold the same highly complex and totally unsuitable hedging product. They shared similar, they shared similar levels of experience of hedging, i.e. none. However, one product was dressed up as a fixed rate loan and embedded into the loan documentation. Consequently, it's viewed as a, not viewed as a derivative product and excluded completely from the review. Latest reports suggest that up to 60,000 businesses have been affected by that. As things stand, in this, these cases, one customer has rightly been offered maximum redress, while the other receiving nothing and having to pursue other avenues, such as the Ombudsman, for example. This brings me on to what I believe to be a very controversial issue, the sophistication test. Let me outline a case study for you. It's a retired restaurateur who had built up a residential property portfolio. Clearly inexperienced and ran his business from home. 
They had no knowledge, no knowledge or previous experience of, of hedging or any complex products or even indeed simple products. We reviewed the case and found a number of failings in the sales standards. The bad news for him is that the product he had was a £10.3 million pounds interest rate swap and consequently excluded from the review. These, hopefully, are the type of injustices we can touch on and address this evening. This now reflects the experience of someone in the audience tonight who we'll be hearing from a bit later. Uh, a farmer from Lincolnshire, uh, categorised as non-sophisticated, believed it was a straightforward process, customer-friendly process indeed. Come and have a chat. Proceeded to the fact find meeting with the bank, in this case it was Barclays. The bank decision, no redress payable. In his own words, if you don't mind Mark, I'll paraphrase for you. I had a three hour fact find call with two lawyers and an independent reviewer appointed by the bank. And I now feel it was a stitch up. I am up, I'm now up against, I'm now up against it, a farmer against a corporate machine. The outcome was contested vigorously, but the bank was sticking to its guns. We became involved and we've managed to set up a meeting between ourselves, Mark, and the bank and the independent reviewer where we can introduce additional evidence we've identified and hopefully turn things around and right or wrong. It's not all bad news. Many parts of the review seem to be working. A bit of background here. Number one, this was a property developer. He was introduced to us by his accountant. We met him the day before he was due to attend a fact find meeting. Thankfully, we intervened and that meeting did not go ahead. We reviewed the case, we found serious failings, but I think most fundamentally helped the client understand that the product itself was basically a bet he could not win and should not have been offered to a retail client. The small gas and heating business, this is a micro business. You know, this really shows, this is a very, very small business in the borders in Scotland. Very, very unsophisticated and frankly confused client. We helped him through the process, prepared a submission on his behalf and the decision was a full tear up and there is still a consequential loss claim outstanding. The printing company. This was introduced by a medium-sized legal firm. They had already participated in a, a telephone meeting with the bank, but they became uneasy in the aftermath because they didn't like the way the meeting had, the direction it had taken, so we became involved. The, re the review process was stopped and we carried out our own review and fact find with the customer and submitted further information to the bank. The decision, it was replaced with an out the money cap now this is actually a, a key area that we'll touch on perhaps later and the ability to understand and historically price alternative products is key. What must change? This is my view only, a genuine sophistication test. At the time when most of these products were sold, there was no such thing as sophisticated and non-sophisticated customers, merely MIFID classifications, and the 10 million limit was arbitrarily introduced. I strongly believe that if a client is non-sophisticated, the amount involved is a supreme irrelevance. They should be afforded the highest of, of protection, <coughs> but the way things stand, they'll be ex excluded from the review. Embedded swaps. It's clearly unjust that thousands of small businesses, and when I say small businesses, they very much are at the small end of small. The very people who deserve the most protection have been excluded, simply due to sleight of hand when it comes to loan documentation. To put it simply, the banks have managed to bypass any regulatory requirements through documentation. Right of appeal. Now this would seem to me fundamental to any transparent review process. It's easy to do and need not cause any further delay in the FCA review process. 
Any appeal simply needs to be reviewed by a different bank's independent reviewer, and this will ensure clarity and, above all, consistency. Hopefully, with the political will and the involvement of the regulator, we'll see this review go beyond where it is at the moment and ensure fairness for all businesses that have been missold hedging products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Scott uh, Cowan, ladies and gentlemen. Our second uh, speaker tonight is the founder and principal of Frankel's Forensics Chartered Accountants. Please welcome John Frankel. Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's still afternoon. The days are getting a bit longer, so I'm not quite ready to call it uh, night in evening. Firstly, a welcome as our, as our co-host with Veritas. We're, we're delighted with the, people, the number of you that have turned up. I'm pleased you came to the right location and that it was communicated to you because due to the, the popularity, we had to change our, our venue. Um, what I like to do often when I, when I give a talk is I like to do a little survey. We've got, we've got a very specific audience here who've got a, a, a lot of experience about what's going on. And, and I'm, I... Personally, I'm involved specifically in the uh, consequential loss side of things. So what I want to do is to get, garner some experience in relation to what your experience is regarding the consequential loss claims. So can I ask th those of you who have either been involved personally or professionally in dealing with any consequential loss claims at, of any nature? Just a show of hands. Any Okay, so if you could, once you put your hands up, if you could leave your hands up for a minute and we'll sort of just drop them. Are those ones just dealing with a flat rate interest only or actual loss of business? Who's dealt with a, who's submitted a loss of business profits claim? You can drop your hands, okay. Who's actually had some feedback from the, uh, from the bank and the, the bank about it? <laughs> Fine. So no one here has settled a consequential loss claim based upon a loss of profits claim. Is that fair to say? Okay, that, that is what I was expecting. I've spoken to a number of other people over the last few weeks, and that seems to be the experience. So this part of the process is quite early on in the, in the sausage machine. So I think it's right to say that not only the banks, but to a certain extent we're all involved with it, there will be an element of making this up as we go along. We've been uh, forensic accountants since 1980, so we've been, we've been doing a, a lot of work uh, involving in de advising clients where they've suffered financial losses. In relation to this particular part of the professional work, we only advise in relation to the consequential loss side. It's Scott and the team at Veritas that deal with the, the liability side and, and the mis-selling side. So the claims that we get involved in, and I'm going to keep coming back to this expression because it, it recurs throughout the literature, is there are some general legal principles involved when dealing with the consequential losses insofar as the, the banks and the FCA put it forward. So let's talk about the consequential loss process in terms of the way we expect it to flow. Firstly, and I'm sure that from one of the, the brief chats that I've had with a few of the audience, that I'm sure many of you would like to be in this stage, is that we have to get to the stage one where the banks have agreed that they, the product has indeed been missold and you've had your first stage one redress offer. It's only at that stage that, the, that you can really start thinking about the consequential loss side and what you may or may not be entitled to recover. It's fair to say that once you, once you get it agreed by the banks that they have missold, the actual calculation of the charges that for the first stage one redress is a relatively straightforward calculation. But when matters come to consequential loss, it's a very different story, and we're going to come onto this now. So when we talk about the basic legal principles involved in, in any piece of litigation, really, and I apologise in advance to the many solicitors and barristers we have present for, for my rather basic uh, talk, but I think, I think this is, it's very crucial so that people get the idea in terms of what's involved. All litigation will have to have these features. Somebody's got to be liable. So where we get to the stage where insofar as the consequential loss aspect is concerned, that we've, gone, we've got over the liability issue. Well, you've, people think they've lost money. That's the quantum side. They say, <laughs> well, I've lost money. But what you have to show is that the monies that were paid under the swaps have caused the loss. 
And that is not a straightforward process in terms of determining the, the, the financial stake involved. The loss mustn't be too remote. It's got to be foreseeable at the time when the contract was entered into. And there's a normal duty for the clients to, to attempt to mitigate their loss. So what are the, the consequential loss options? There are three. And this is based upon the, um, some recent literature that we got from, um, from Barclays. Now, as I say, each bank, and you may have slightly different experiences, they might ex express this differently depending upon which bank you've, uh, you've, you've, you've come across. But basically, the first one is the flat rate of interest. The second one is the flat rate of interest plus out-of-pocket expenses. And finally, there's a loss of profits plus the out-of-pocket expenses. And what I want to do is I want to go through each of those heads to give you some idea in terms of what's involved. The first one is the most straightforward. And I think that some of you who put your hands up early on may have had this in mind. This is where you've, you've got the flat rate of interest. The banks are offering 8% flat uh, on a simple interest. And typically, from, um, from when the, you started paying until 90 days after the letter of offer, you've got so given you some time to think about it. It's simple interest, not compound. No questions asked by the bank. You don't have to do anything. It's a straightforward offer. And this clearly is what the banks want clients to accept. When you want the interest plus out-of-pocket expenses, things start getting a little bit more interesting from a legal point of view. Firstly, you get your flat rate of interest as before. Secondly, and I put this in capitals, and I'm going to come to another slide about this, is you need to show causation. It's not just enough to say, I've incurred these costs. You have to show that the, the financial consequences of the mis-selling caused the financial loss. And that's a very important link that has to be done in this process. And the typical heads that are rec recoverable in this are bank charges, which might just be the small amounts of, of return checks, which can add up over a long period of time. Or it might be the fact that somebody's been put into some something like uh, some uh, recovery program where the costs can be very extensive. But you cannot recover the bank interest or any other interest that you've incurred as a result of that because they say the flat rate of interest is to cover that element of loss. There are legal and other professional fees, but the legal fees with typically, the ones that will be allowed, will be those before the whole process with the FCA started which I think will be about the first quarter or maybe the first half of 2012. If those of you have entered into a, um, a, a legal battle with the banks prior to that, then, the, then it should be, the banks should agree, as I understand it, to pay some, make some contribution towards costs on normal general principle basis. Other professional fees might involve accountants' fees to help you where you've had to help somebody with your cash flow requirements because of the additional budgeting that's been required. These have got to be costs that flow as a result of it. Some to what we've had uh, um, from, from um, Curram, who's here, who's, who's a, a client of mine who's going to tell us his story shortly, is where the consequence of that has resulted in having to get be looked after much more closely in another bank's um, um, system and that has resulted in having the bank saying, I want somebody to come in to have a, a financial check on you. That sort of com comes under the category of out-of-pocket expenses. There can be late payment charges for dealing with suppliers or with HMRC in relation to income tax, corporation tax, or, or VAT. And also, there can be tax consequences, uh, more so likely for income tax rather than corporation tax, but in theory, the corporation tax as well. Where you get your compensation in one go, you might get it at a much higher rate of tax than you got your original relief from in the first place. And that could result in a head of, head of loss, but you have to see what you have to make comparisons in terms of what the tax position was before and after um, over, the, over the period. Let me touch on causation. What the banks are saying is we have to follow general legal principles. And they're setting the bar very high, which I don't have a particular issue with as long as there's a degree of consistency about it. What we have to show 
is that the, the ch swaps charges that were paid caused the losses. And what we're finding in the cases that we're dealing with, we're having to do a very detailed financial analysis on pretty much a day-by-day -day basis to show what the financial position of the company was at the same time that it was incurring all the swaps charges. And then we can see that the other costs that were being incurred at that time were caused by that failure to have that money. So we're doing running totals in terms of the swap charges paid against the, the banking position, and we're having to do some very detailed financial analysis on a daily basis. And I believe that's the only way that the banks will actually have to accept that, the, um, that there, was, there was a causation. We have had cases where, that we've taken on where clients had already put forward quite substantial claims, a couple come to mind, both in excess of £2 million, and the, and the banks rejected them out of hand, didn't offer a penny, because they said there was no, there was no evidence in relation to causation. So that, that has to be at the core of any successful compensation for um, a consequential loss. The final option, the third option, is, is the following, where you're going for a loss of profits claim plus out-of-pocket out expenses. And I should add, actually, that out-of-pocket expenses seems to suggest they might be rather modest, but there can be some very significant costs that have been incurred that, are, that should be recoverable in, in many cases, I've no doubt. In, those situa in this situation, you don't get any interest at all. The, you, you will, in, I think in some cases, you probably will lose the option of having your flat rate interest. The, the letters I've seen from the bank say, if you want to go down the consequential loss route, if you get that, that's fine, but it might be less than the interest. And of course, they're using that as a, as a threat to try to settle <coughs> it on the basis of the simple 8% flat rate. So we have to show the, uh, the out-of-pocket expenses, plus you can claim any extra interest that you may have paid because you're not being compensated for the interest on that. But again, we need to show causation. That financial analysis has to be shown. It's not enough just to say, These are, this is what I've suffered and I've had to pay my swap charges. You have to show that causal link. So the typical heads of likely to see in relation to the um, consequential loss will be loss of opportunity to buy a property or maybe being forced to sell a property. Lost sales due to lack of working capital and having to shrink the business or perhaps a lost chance to upgrade facilities that, that had been planned and the consequential loss that will flow from that. And that will follow a typical um, business loss uh, that we might see in an entirely different context in, in our role as forensic accountants. So, in summary, wh where do we stand all this? We have to look very carefully to see what the client has not only lost, but what can recover. We have to make sure that the damages are not too remote. Of course, the banks are going to say this has all happened through the credit crunch and there are lots of other factors going on. And another issue that we're coming across is the issue in relation to where there are connected parties where people may structure their businesses. So they've got one entity that trades with another or deals with another. Only one had the swap, but the other may have suffered. Um, I've recently had two cases like this. And I hope during the discussion period to perhaps uh, throw this open to the audience to see what, what, is, what has been done. So we have to show the causal link, absolutely crucial to get a successful recovery. From the bit of a very amateurish research that I've done, I think that, uh, I suspect that probably about 80% of the cases might just go for a flat rate um, um, for the flat rate option, which I think would include some out-of-pocket expenses. But I think that the pure consequential loss cases are probably likely to be 20, around the 20% bracket. Having said that, some of the, uh, there was an article recently in, in the press saying that, the, that the, the estimates are that the consequential loss um, damages where you can get them will actually be more than the actual basic stage one redress, because where, if you're successful on it, they can be very high level of damages. So the 20% so the are going to have to show causation. That's going to require very detailed financial analysis, or the banks will reject those completely out of hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.
John Frankel, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, John, just can I just check, when you say the first settlement is 8% interest the banks will pay, 8% of what? 8% of the charges, the charges that they've reimbursed to you. And is that a, will they pay that interest over a period of time, or do they? No, no, no. They, they they'll pay that. That normally works. From what I've seen, is about twenty to thirty percent of the ch with the charges that you've actually paid under the swap contract. Then that the, you get interest on that for having mm. been out of your money, lost opportunity. The banks are saying, and that work, depends when you entered into it and the contract, of course. But it's something working in the order of about twenty to thirty percent of the actual basic redress. Right, okay, thank you. <coughs> right, our third speaker tonight is a member of the Influential Treasury Select Committee in the House of Commons, uh, but also a member of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Interest Rate Swap Mis-Selling. Please welcome Mark Garnier. Uh, well, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. And um, it is a great pleasure to, so if you like, come from head office to say that we're listening to you and we are really sort of paying attention to what's going on with this. Um, not only am I a member of parliament, a member of the Treasury Select Committee, I was also a former investment banker and hedge fund manager. So uh, aside from making me one of the most unpopular people on the planet, uh, it does also mean that I have uh, a reasonable sort of inside knowledge into how these things work. And I think probably it's worth starting with uh, really kind of what is the issue with these, with these interest rate swaps. Um, I spent uh, 18 months on the Parliamentary, Banking Commission's, uh, Parliamentary Commission for Banking Standards where we were looking at a whole wide range of, uh, of, of issues surrounding banks. And it was absolutely the case that this whole issue of interest rate hedging products and mis-selling came up as a specific subject that we wanted to look at. And the reason we wanted to look at it was because it's an incredibly um, totemic uh, example, if you like, of how banks behave when they're with their customers and how they look at treating the customers fairly or, or otherwise. And I think in the first instance, as I say, it's, it's probably worth just sort of you know, summarising what actually is an interest rate swap. I mean, of course, everybody in this room will understand exactly what the bit of it is that they know about, that bit where they've been persuaded one way or the other to take out a product, which means that they have an interest rate cap, but they also have an interest rate collar. So, of course, when interest rates go, go below them, uh, you know, the, go below the collar, they end up having to pay what, what feels like a penalty. And there's a reason why this, this thing is structured in this particular way. The bank isn't simply taking a naked bet with, the, with you as a consumer. They're not simply sort of saying, well, look, if we win the bet uh, when interest rates go down, you'll have to pay us. That goes into our, into our coffers. And if we lose the bet and interest rates go up, we'll have to pay you. Actually, what's happening is there is another side of this trade. For it to be a swap, you have to have two sides. And whilst you have, on one side, uh, a huge number of people who are running perhaps nursing homes or they're doing property development or that kind of stuff at a relatively small level. On the other side of the swap, you have ferociously uh, qualified and intelligent people who are running you know, tens of billions of pounds worth of, worth of pension funds. So if you are somebody who wants to borrow money and you want to cap the rate of interest you're going to pay at, on the other side of this swap is somebody who wants to receive a fixed rate of interest on their investment. So if you're a pension fund manager, what you really want to do is to make sure that you are going to get enough income on, for example, your zero-rate uh, bonds that you may be holding or your other funds which you may be holding, which is going to meet your pension liabilities. And what the bank does is the bank creates a, a swap between one and the other. And this is where the whole thing has gone horribly wrong. Let me describe it in a much more simple way. Let me describe it as if you are a second-hand car dealer and what you trade in is the most uh, fantastic, classic, valuable, historic Ferraris. And you find somebody who wants to sell his 250 GTO Ferrari, fabulous, very limited edition, 1960s Le Mans racing car. And you're going to give him 10 million quid for that. But you're not going to buy it on spec. You're going to find somebody on the other side of the trade who's going to buy it. And chances are you'll probably sell that on for not much more than 10 million pounds. Maybe you'll make 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds is a lot of money. But, it's, uh, but relative to the 10 million pounds, it's not a lot. But the whole point about it is that as a second-hand car dealer, you don't have all this cash, but you do have the buyer and the seller and now you've, you've, you've made, if you like, that guaranteed turn in the middle. The trouble is, imagine if you find yourself as that car dealer and you want to impress your latest girlfriend, you've you know, had a little bit to drink, and so you think you're going to take this Ferrari for a spin around the block. You've already borrowed the £10 million to pay the one side of the trade, and the next morning you're going to give this car to the other guy who's going to pay you the £10 million, £10 million and £100,000 on delivery. But during the night you're fooling around too much and you crash the car and you write it off and now you've got no car to deliver. The problem is you still owe the £10 million to the 
person you bought the car off, but now you haven't got the car to deliver to the, to the person. And that is exactly what's happened with these interest rate hedging products, which have been missold to huge numbers of smaller businesses around the country. The banks literally have had a car crash. Well, it's not literally had a car crash, but you know what I mean. They've had a big car crash. Because the problem is, they still have the other side of the trade. They still have the other side of this swap, which is still an ongoing contract, which they have to deliver in, uh, um, a, a fixed rate of interest, if you like, to those pension funds that are now expecting to get this money coming through. And on the other side are people like you and the people you represent who have been missold this product, and that's where the car crash has happened. So now there is a, a, a lopsided equilibrium in the bank. And this causes huge numbers of dynamics which are going on within the bank. Because the first is that all these contracts, whether they're on the pension fund side or on the consumer side, have a net present value. And that net present value is made up of a number of factors, one of which is duration to run of the product. The longer you leave it, the lower the net present value of this product becomes. Now, whilst the compensation for the consumer is set going back to the initiation of the uh, product, the problem for the bank on the other side of the trade, or the advantage, if you like, of delaying it, is that that, that balance sheet implication for the bank is going down every single day. Another problem which we've discovered in talking to the banks is actually, amazingly, they don't seem to know what the net present value of all these contracts is. There are guesses that are out there. There's, there's estimates of what the um, compensation scheme is going to be worth, and we hear different numbers of 800 million from one bank, 1.6 billion from another bank. But these are potentially very, very small numbers compared with what the net present value is of the entire trade given both sides. And I've heard estimates that actually the net present value could be as high as £40 billion within the banking system. If these trades start to fall down, there are significant uh, balance sheet implications for the banks. And again, this creates a very, very strong incentive for the banks to prevaricate over delivering redress. And this is bad for business. This is bad for the consumer. And it's bad for the image of the banks. Over the past couple of years on the Banking Commission, we've looked very, very carefully at the, the way the banks have been operating and the way the banks have been trying to, to, to smarten up their image. And there's no doubt about it that when you talk to senior people at the banks, and bear in mind all of the senior people at these banks are now new individuals, they are all absolutely sincere, I believe, in their desire to do the right things by banks. But the problem is, and I've come, come across this on a number of occasions, that when the banks have a conversation with you and they feel that they want to help out a consumer or customer who's been badly treated at whatever level, you come away with a very warm and, and moist and, and, and happy feeling that the bank really is listening to you. But the letter that arrives a week later has been crawled over by the lawyers. And when that letter arrives, you suddenly realise actually the bank's not going to do the right thing because, they've been, uh, because they have legal implications. And this is causing uh, great, great problems. So what we're doing in Parliament is we're trying to make sure that we're going to push this thing along the way. We're doing it through the Treasury Select Committee. The Banking Commission has now finished its work, but the all-party parliamentary group for the interest rate swap uh, mis-selling is, uh, is working incredibly hard to keep pushing hard with the uh, Financial Conduct Authority to make sure that the redress, the redress scheme is, is, is moving forward. I am pleased that there's been some success at this. HSBC broke ranks and separated the consequential loss from the financial redress, uh, which was a very, very good thing, and the other banks seem to be doing that as well. I believe it was completely wrong that the Financial Conduct Authority was allowing these two elements to be linked together inextricably. If you know that there's a, there's a financial redress, just pay it, and then you can deal with the other stuff at your, at your leisure. But the point is, you, we know that there are certain issues which can be paid out quickly. HSBC broke ranks, everybody else seems to be breaking ranks as well, and that's a good sign that the banks are, are, are trying to do the right thing. But I also think um, that what's happening with this is a test of a number of different things. We've heard from the banks endlessly since the financial crisis that they've listened, they've learned, they've learned from their mistakes, they're going to move on, they're going to do the right thing. We saw proof that this isn't the case. Uh, with the actions from uh, Lloyds Bank, who were fined £29 million. It sounds a relatively small amount of money compared to the LIBOR fines, but they were fined £29 million for creating an incentive scheme for their frontline staff that uh, resulted in, uh, in, in mis-selling of, uh, interest pro uh, sorry, of uh, insurance products. And this happened in between 2010 and 2012, fully two to four years after the financial crisis. There are still very, very bad habits in the banks. What we're looking for from the banks 
is for evidence that the banks have genuinely changed. How they deliver the redress to consumers is immensely important. If they get this right, then it is a sign that they're moving on. If they get it wrong, then it is a very, very clear sign that it's business as usual at banks, bad old business as usual. Secondly, we're very, very keen to see that the new Financial Conduct Authority works well. The regulators have gone through a period of quite intense uh, churn over the last few years. We've moved from the Financial Services Authority, the Financial Conduct Authority, and the Prudential Regulatory Authority. Those two bodies are new. There have been some changes of staff. We've seen some changes at the head. And we're very keen to see how Martin Wheatley, as the new head of the FCA, gets on and Clive Adamson gets on in terms of dealing with this specifically. And we get them in front of us on a regular basis, either through the Treasury Select Committee or through the all-party group. And I think Clive Adamson's due to come and see us in the next couple of weeks to give us an update. But I'm not entirely happy with the way it's happening. It should be the case that the banks should be handling this in an open and fair way directly with the consumer. I found myself visiting a lawyer uh, on behalf of some uh, constituents of mine on Monday uh, over an issue with another bank which is not related to this type of problem. But I fell into conversation with a specific lawyer and he told me that he was represented, this is in Worcester, he's representing 70 businesses that feel they need legal advice in order to get this redress. It's not right that the regulator is not doing this, and my apologies to those of you who are lawyers here, who are hopefully do a very good job but also have been paid for it, but it's not right that people should be paying to get that advice. It should be coming properly from the, from the banks and the FCA should be making sure that's happening. So my final message really is that um, you know, we really genuinely are listening. There are quite a few of us in Parliament who really do understand what's going on with this and spend a great deal of our time making sure that this is going to come to a conclusion. Unfortunately, businesses have gone bust, and I suspect more businesses will go bust as a direct result of this. Banks don't care because, of course, they're the creditors, so they're really paying themselves back when, they, when the redress scheme is paid. So it's a fairly sort of circular uh, argument for them. But for people's livelihoods, it's incredibly difficult. People setting up businesses are taking huge personal risks. They're working incredibly long hours, and they absolutely rely on their banks to do the right thing for them. And clearly, in this case, banks have got it wrong. They've only got a short period of time to prove to us that they're getting it right, and they're certainly running out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Mark Garnier. Mark, who's the minister in government that's uh, responsible for this? Sajid Javid. As the um, economic secretary of the Treasury? Yes. Yeah. All right. And a former, a former banker as well. Indeed. Yeah. Has he taken a lot of interest in it? He has, actually, yes. We had a, we had a meeting with him the other day. We, uh, the, there's an organisation called Bully Banks, um, mm. which is uh, a very a lobbying, a lobbying group, absolutely. Uh, they've worked incredibly hard with Guto Beb, who's the member for Aberconway, who's, who's the chairman of the, of the APPG. Um, and Sajid, who actually is my neighbour in uh, Bromsgrove in uh, North Worcestershire, um, who I know very well, uh, actually does take a very, very keen interest in it. He, and again, he completely understands the issues that are surrounding this. So it is refreshing that A, he understands, and B, he, you know, he, he also shares this interest, having been a, an investment banker for many years, he shares this interest that actually the banks do need to sort themselves out. Okay, we'll come on to some of these issues in, in a minute. But first, let's hear from three people who've uh, been victims of this mis-selling scandal. The first is a farmer involved in property development, battling with Barclays for compensation. Nick Teasdale, come and tell us your story. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I stand before you a picture of non-sophistication um, from the fens of Lincolnshire. Um, I mean, I'm pleased I'm not sophisticated, and um, probably just to emphasize how unsophisticated I am, I didn't actually realize I was being sold anything until someone told me that there was a mis-selling of these products. And then it dawned on me, um, bit by bit, that actually what was going on here, as Marx just pointed out, was the banks more or less looking after their own interests, and I think putting my interests um, at the back of the, uh, the line. Um, I operate a small family farm, 350 acres, in near Stamford in South Lincolnshire. Um, been in partnership with my dad, who's 75 at the time. Um, we, uh, the office is a 20-foot porter cabin, uh, beside an old barn, a uh, few old tractors in there. Um, when I came back to the farm, we decided we were going to make a, a, a job of converting our old farm buildings into offices. So um, 
I undertook uh, a conversion of 6,000 square feet of offices, uh, which actually you know, took a huge amount of time from my point of view and quite a bit sizable financial risk uh, from my point of view. Uh, we banked with Barclays for 60 odd years. Um, you know, my bank manager was, I guess, someone that you know, I had a relationship with. Um, perhaps naively, um, you know, I, I sort of did what he, he said. He was a chap with the purse strings. He had to charge over all my land um, to get uh, to give me a loan. So, um, you know, I take uh, I take his advice very seriously. So, in 2007, he came to me. Um, he, he gave me a loan um, to cover the, uh, the the development, and then he came to me um, a couple of months later, and he was concerned that if interest rates rose, whether we'd be able to repay um, the loan, and um, at that time, um, as I say, I, I really didn't question his advice, um, perhaps stupidly now, um, and he suggested that what I needed was to get in, um, to have a chat with his friends at Barclays Capital. Um, he then uh, got in touch with these guys at Barclays Capital, uh, who sent me an email saying, Nick, you know, why don't you have a, a look at these products? There's a cap and collar and a fixed rate swap um, we can do for you um, and within two weeks of this arriving um, and followed by a, um, a quick illustration emailed over um, somehow I had <laughs> agreed at the end of a phone call with a, some guy down in Canary Wharf um, to, to set off on a 10-year uh, scheme which I couldn't get out of and if I wanted to get out of it it was going to cost me you know over a hundred thousand pounds um, and that was on the basis of a phone call, which, uh, as I say, was instigated actually by a, a chap in Canary Wharf phoning me up in my porter cabin on the 17th of December. Um, clearly, I, I don't know what I said in that phone call, but I must, have been, uh, I must have been impressed by what he told me because I said yes at the end of it. Um, so that got me into this swap deal. Um, so I, I, look, I look back at the sort of motivations that there were. My motivation was my bank manager had told me that he wasn't comfortable with the loan as it stood and I needed something to do, uh, to do something about it. He didn't offer me to rip up the old loan and give me a fixed rate. I would have understood that. That was a, a loan at a fixed rate. But instead I was offered a swap with this cap collar and everything else trundles along. Um, so in looking at it now, you know, I, I clearly see that obviously that the chap about this capital was actually selling me something um, and presumably my bank manager probably got some little inter, <coughs> interbank um, you know, remuneration out of it as well. It was all very nice. Um, in 2009, I went back to them because I, I said, well, actually, it's not adding up, you know, as you told me. Um, again, I got a very complicated email back telling me about when the, the loans were paid against, uh, you know, and, and the interest rates, I didn't understand that much either, but eventually the, it was fixed. Um, net result is obviously that my business uh, hasn't done very well. I'm now paying um, exorbitant after, uh, overdraft charges basically to pay the swap loan. Um, and I don't see any way out of it. I've got, you know, until 2017, um, I, I'm, I'm stuck with it. So, a bit late in the day, I came to Scott because um, Barclays very kindly confirmed that I wasn't sophisticated and they um, invited me to, um, into the review and to, um, I can't remember, what, I think they said, why don't you share your recollections of the, of the swap um, with um, their lawyers or um, the, the financial uh, review lawyers. And so, um, I did. I had this free ad telephone conversation with uh, a couple of lawyers and an independent reviewer. It was all recorded. And effect effectively, um, my recollections were obviously taken down and used in evidence against me. Um, because since then, um, they haven't really given me any information um, back as to what um, this guy at Barclays Capital did um, or what my bank manager did. Um, they've just obviously decided that my recollections seem to fit in with their, what they decided was that at the point of sale was acceptable. So um, they told me no redress. Um, 
you know, and everything stands. So clearly, a bit late in the day, I got in touch with uh, Scott, and we've now actually agreed a meeting with them. I've always fancied going to Canary <coughs> Wharf, but I have to say, I'm a little daunted by the prospect of, of this meeting, but um, at least it's a, you know, it's a chink of light going forward. Okay, sure. Nick, thank you very much Thanks for that. that. The bit that made me sit up in your story was when you said that having dealt with the clearing bank side, or the high street bank side, to build some offices in the fens, that all of a sudden you're dealing with bar cap. I mean, that in itself seems to me to be predatory action, that they bring in the major investment arm to, to, deal, to deal with this. Why would, they do, why would they do that? Unless it was a, there is a deal going on that the clearing bank side, the high street side, is getting a skim of any business they bring to Barcamp. I mean, there's, there's a technical reason for it, which is that these products are beyond mm. the wit of the, yes. of the regional managers. <laughs> and, and, they ha and by law, they have to get somebody who knows what they're doing, which is where, and you get a breakdown. This is the problem, because your, your relationship manager, as you said, is your friend, you know, mm. in inverted commas. This, this hot-headed red braces wearing, you know, nutter down in Barcap in uh, Canary Wharf isn't your friend, he's a trader. But he's qualified to be able to tell you what it is. So he's, he's if you like, the regulatory bridge. And, and he's interested in, in, in putting together this, this match trade. Um, no, no, it's shocking. I mean, really mm. shocking, actually. Okay. What's happened. You, should, you should never have met this thing. Yes, of course. A former Barclays Capital trader said that Barclays was the only one that was interested in the match trade. Barclays was the only trader that had the That's, That's where it begins right. to That's join right. up. Yeah. Fascinating. Let's hear from someone else now, a property developer, excluded from the FCA review on the grounds of being deemed a sophisticated investor. Please welcome Patrick Hegarty. Good evening. I'm Patrick Hegarty of WG Mitchell, which is, uh, was a family-owned company uh, based in Londonderry. Uh, we are third-generation butchering business, uh, which had a small property side to it. And over 20 or 30 years, we built that property business into quite a substantial uh, investment company, specializing in, towards the end, property uh, investing and property running. We had, to, uh, at the end of the, our company was placed in administration in 2009, and we had, at the time, some 300 employees. Um, well, from the six years, from 2002 to 2008, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland principally, but some other banks, sold us uh, swaps with a gross value of some £800 million. Um, they, they weren't sold to us. They were conditioned of getting any loans that we had to take these swaps. Um, at the end, we had one swap which uh, in April 2009 meant that we were paying twice the interest that would have been payable if we hadn't had to swap. So this was instrumental in the downfall of the company. And the, it has been deemed that we were, or I was, a sophisticated investor and should have understood the technicalities of what I was entering into. Uh, where I, I did have an idea of what a swap implied. Uh, it was in no way, I had, don't have any financial background as such, I was a property. I understand the property market. I don't particularly understand uh, sort of arcane financial products, and the the sophistication w wasn't there from our point of view. But the main thing was that we didn't get a chance to. We, we had no choice. We had to buy these. We had to take these swaps out, and as I said, led to the demise of our family company. Patrick, thank you very much thank for you. that. And again, the thing that jumps out from your testimony is don't take the swap and you don't get the loan. So they put a gun to your head. Again, which you would think should be either illegal or immoral or probably both. Uh, let us hear from our, our third testimonial uh, tonight. Uh, he runs two Best Western Hotels in Ipswich. 
He has three swaps and he's dealing with claims against RBS and Santander as well as Barclays. So he's fighting across the piece here uh, and involved in consequential loss, which is interesting too. Please welcome uh, Karam Saeed. Hi, it's Karam. In 2005, we were a small 19-bedroom hotel in Ipswich, and uh, we were planning to extend, uh, put up another 19 bedrooms. So our bankers were Barclays, went to them, asked them that we need another eight, 900,000 pounds to do the extension. They said, you're fine. Uh, gave us the offer letter. We signed contracts with the construction company. Construction started. A uh, month down the line, uh, he called me and he said that uh, we've got somebody from Barclays Capital coming in to our offices, and I would just like to uh, bring him over to uh, just to explain how things are in the, on the interest uh, side of things. So I said, fine. He brought him over, and this guy said that, look, uh, interest rates are going to rise, and you really need to uh, make sure that you're able to meet your debt, ob debt obligations uh, by entering into a product, which is a brand new product which uh, Barclays have introduced. Uh, and it is something that will, it's a win-win situation for you. So basically he ex gave me this particular product, which now I know is called a structured collar. Uh, and uh, he said, I just took his word for it, and I said, fine, okay. I had already started the construction, uh, and I didn't want anything to happen to uh, our relationship with Barclays. Uh, he, he gave me a slide. The next week he called me. I was at home uh, one day. It was a day off for me. And he said, look, uh, we need to enter into this product today. Otherwise, the rates are going to go up. I said, Fine, OK. So over the phone, we entered into this transaction. That was, uh, as far as Barclays was concerned, that was it. Uh, in 2007, we moved our banking over to NatWest. Uh, NatWest, uh, as a part of the deal, obviously because we already had this uh, particular swap transaction with Barclays, they said that that will need to be a word they used, novated over to themselves, uh, which I said, fine, it will basically be transferred over to themselves, to RBS. And at the same time, they said that, look, this is a superb product that you've got, so <laughs> you need to buy another uh, product from us uh, to protect the additional borrowing that you've got with us. So fine, okay. So they sold us another two products, one for each company. This was part of a condition of the loan. Uh, took it. Uh, unfortunately, later down, uh, I think in 2000 and uh, early eight, the bank manager who had sold me the first product at Barclays came over to as my bank manager at RBS or NatWest. Uh, I wasn't very happy with him, uh, so I moved my banking uh, relationship to Santander, and along with that, all three swaps were transferred or novated over to Santander. 2009, obviously interest rates start to go down, and instead of paying half a percent, I was paying like 9% almost, or almost 10%. Uh, Tried to keep up to those payments. Uh, in 2010, I started to basically fall behind on my payments to, uh, for these swaps. Uh, 2011, I was told that uh, they will need to do a, uh, Santander told us that, look, uh, you're a bad risk. We will need to conduct a strategic business review uh, of your business to see whether you are running uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, obviously, at cost, which was then added to the loan. The business review people came out and they said that everything is fine as far as the uh, working is concerned. Uh, there is this issue of uh, the swap payments and uh, because of these swap payments, uh, it's the, the business is not able to uh, meet their debt, obliga debt obligations. Uh, anyway, uh, in 2012, January, I saw in one of the newspapers that uh, there was, I think it was the Daily Mail, 
that there has been some talk about the mis-selling of these uh, products. So I contacted my solicitors and uh, they said, fine, we'll help you with it. Obviously, I didn't have any money, so I entered into a conditional fee agreement with them. Uh, so I had two or three swaps. One was Bar one with Barclays, two with Na NatWest, RBS. And they were both sitting at this moment in time with Santander, who basically said that we never sold you these swaps, so we've got nothing to do with it. Go to Barclays or go to NatWest. Uh, so we issued proceedings against uh, Barclays and NatWest uh, in early 2012. Uh, in uh, July 2000, and, uh, oh, sorry, uh, August 2012, we had our uh, fact find uh, with uh, Barclays. In uh, October, on the 25th of October 2012, we were told by Barclays that uh, yes, the product has been missold, and that you will be getting a full refund of all the monies paid under the swaps, uh, plus 8% uh, interest. Uh, which, after a lot of fight, because initially they said they will not pay us that till we agree the consequential loss side of things. And I said, look, I don't have the money. You need to pay me. So ultimately, they did pay us that amount. We submitted our consequential loss claim on the same, uh, uh, probably after a week or so, which was, uh, and that was only for out-of-pocket expenses. There was nothing to do with the loss of profit. Uh, and a lot of it was also to do with our legal fees that we had incurred during that time. They basically, uh, I had an email from Barclays saying that within two weeks you will have a response to your consequential loss claim. Kept uh, calling them, emailing them. In January, they basically uh, sent me a letter saying that uh, none of your consequential loss claims are acceptable uh, because they do not meet these legal principles. And I called them and I said, look, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a tell you. I don't know what the legal principles are. You've asked me to give you, give you all the, uh, the, the losses that I've suffered, which are out-of-pocket expenses, which I did. And they said, look, you bank with Santander. Uh, you don't bank with us, so we do not have the internal credit files. If you can go back to Santander and tell them to give us their internal credit files, we will then be able to basically uh, look at your consequential loss claims. And I said, I asked them the question, I said, okay, if I was to come to you as a customer and ask you, can you give me copies of your internal credit files, will you give those to me? And he said, no. <laughs> so I said, how do you expect me to go to Santander and ask them to give, them, give me their internal credit files, which are confidential, and give them to you? He said, I'm sorry, but basically we can't uh, do anything without it. Uh, at that point, I went to Frankel's, and uh, Frankel's are now in the process of uh, uh, producing a document for me, which hopefully will uh, come up with those legal uh, uh, rules which consequential losses are supposed to be. The whole thing in all, this, all of this is that FCA have always said that we do not need any professional advice. And here I am. I tried to not use my professional advice as far as the consequential loss was concerned. I used my uh, professional advice for issuing proceedings. Whatever redress monies I got, most of it has now been paid to the solicitors. Uh, so basically, I haven't got much left. Uh, and Barclays uh, have refused to pay us any of our legal fees uh, because they said that this was supposed to be a simple process and the FCA have said it is a simple process. Uh, even though most of those were incurred prior to June 2012. So at this moment in time, we don't know what's going to happen. Whatever monies they've had, they've paid us, has gone to the solicitors. Uh, we will need to see what comes out of uh, this report, which is being presented to them in the ne next couple of weeks. With regards to uh, NatWest, RBS, uh, we are still waiting a, a decision from them. Uh, we sent them our, uh, or we had their our fact find back last year in July. Still haven't heard from them, so don't know what's going to happen. But in the meantime, basically our business has gone down because we've paid in the last five years around half a million pounds out to these guys. Uh, and it's just hemorrhaged the cash flow. We haven't had any cash flow, and it's just ruined our business, and also my life. So. Thank you.
you very much. I must say, Karam, when I listen to your testimony and add it into the other two we've had, I'm, I'm flabbergasted why nobody's in jail for this. Uh, it's just remarkable that people can get away with this. Uh, let me uh, invite now, by the way, you can take part in the debate here uh, the, the, on the Twitter, there's hashtag swaps debate. Feel free to take part in that and tweet uh, away as much as you like. Uh, let me invite two other people on to the stage and I'm gonna ask some questions then I'm gonna throw it open to you. First of all, uh, Mike Cherry, I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, policy, national policy chairman of the Federation of Small Businesses and also Caroline Wayman, the legal director and principal ombudsman of the Financial Ombudsman Service. Welcome to, to you. Uh, a little round of applause for our two new guests. Uh, Scott, can I ask you, uh, how, if you're in this circumstance and the bank makes you an offer of redress, how, how do you judge that it's a fair offer? It's actually, a, it's, it's a, for fear to sound like a politician, no offence, but it's a good question, Andrew. Um, when politicians say that to me, you know, they're not going to answer <laughs> yes, the question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I'll answer questions. You know, the, the, the fact is that in some cases it can be relatively straightforward. If, you know, if you're offered a full tear-up, if we part the consequential loss side for a moment, in stage one redress, if you're offered a full tear-up, then, well, that's really, you can't get any more than that. You can't get better than that. Um, it's somewhere in the middle. What... What's muddied the water slightly, and I think what certainly causes the most concern for me is the, the whole issue of alternative products. Now, it seems counterintuitive that the bank can say, OK, we missold you that, but, well, no, we ain't going to refund you the money. We're going to replace it with another product that we think you would have bought at the time. Um, if that product um, is a cap, which... The reason they're able to do that is they're arguing that it was a legitimate condition of the lending, which I would stress at that point, you have to be very careful or very thorough to make sure that it was, that you'd have had to have something in place. So the alternative product was a cap, which genuinely, generally as well, and it, depending on what rate it was struck at, should still offer you significant redress. The worrying trend that I think may come is this idea that to say we sold you this really toxic swap, but we think we'd have taken a swap anyway. And that minimises the, the redress payable, you know, to virtually nothing in some cases. I mean, I've seen redress letters that say, we're, your redress is minus £30,000. <laughs> Not one that we've represented that have come to us late in the day, that, that just seems incredible. Is the onus on the, the customer, on the victim, which is maybe a better description than customer, to prove that it was a miss sale? The FCA and the banks, you know, I think it was touched on, I think Nick touched on it earlier, you know, are at pains to point out that you don't need expert advice. And I think, you know, this is best summed up that, you know, it's all over every letter that you don't need expert advice. I wonder if you can guess what the first thing the letter that says you ain't getting any redress says, you should go and seek expert advice. So I don't think it does any harm. I think the way that most people view banks, and you know, let's not pick over the carcass, but the, the fact is that if you are defensive, you know, you haven't done anything wrong, you've been missold, it doesn't, you know, I think it serves no, it doesn't do any harm to get on the front foot and to say, this is where you missold me. You know, and that's basically where I come in and say, this is where the missile took place. Let me do the independent reviewer's job for them. Because what I'd also stress about the independent reviewers, you know, they are from the big, generally, the big firms of accountants. Now, I'm sure they're very, you know, smart people, but they're no experts in derivatives or the sale of derivative mm -hmm. products. So they do need, in my opinion, to be signposted where, the, you know, where it's gone wrong. Mike, a lot of you members will have been affected by this, representing small and uh, medium-sized businesses. Is there a, a, a fear among some of you members who've been victims of this that it, they take the view, yeah, I've been badly treated, but it could be a mistake to pick a fight with one of these big banks? I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think, first and foremost, my heart goes out to all of those uh, business people who have been missold these products. It should never, ever have happened in the first place. 
And if you compare it to PPI mis-selling, which is just accepted by the banks, most people are just paid out mm. willy-nilly, why isn't that happening in this case? And why should businesses have to go through all of this? And why have businesses failed because of these problems? Well, let me put that question straight to Mark Garney. Why isn't that happening? Why isn't it? Well, well, in the case of the, the, the PPI mis-selling, uh, just a, a, a substantial amount of money was made available and people were compensated. I mean, it's one of the reasons why the economies finally started to grow under your government. <laughs> Uh, oh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, well, we've had have nothing to, to do with all the other stuff we've done. We've had to wait long enough for it to happen. Uh, and uh, why can't we, I mean, uh, Mr. Cherry's point, I think, yeah. is why can't that, a version of that, simply be done on this? Yeah. It, it, the, it's quite an interesting problem, this, because, of course, had interest rate not gone down to these very low levels, actually the problem probably wouldn't have emerged. If interest rates had just stuck where they were, then, then actually this wouldn't have been a, wouldn't, wouldn't have been Yeah, but the interest rates been. went down to these uh, abnormal mm. levels as a direct consequence of government policy. It's been government yeah, policy. Yeah, you flooded the market mm. with QE, mm. and it, when you flood the market with anything, the price drops, and that's what you did. There are a number of different issues that come into this, though, Andrew, which are, um, first of all, you're trying to work out actually, uh, you know, for example, if, you, if you're going to go buy a house, many people will go and choose um, a mortgage where you have uh, a, a fixed rate mortgage. So actually, there's not a, you know, if, you, if you think about an incredibly simplistic term, it's not a bad thing to do in theory to, to, to plan for your, you know, what your cash flow is going to be. And, th and that's something which everybody would do if you're going to buy a house, you'll, you'll, you'll fix your interest rates. The problem is, is that what people thought they were doing was essentially buying a, 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 a fixed rate mortgage, and actually it was something far more complicated. And this is the problem. The, the, what the regulators is doing, and I'm not trying to justify this, I'm just trying to explain what they're doing, is they're trying to sort of disaggregate what's been going on within this. So, so actually, was it a, a reasonable thing that should have been done? Actually, if you were going to buy an in, a fixed-rate mortgage, would you have done that in the first place? The other thing, of course, though, is, is, is this business of how they were sold. And actually, this is an incredibly important point with the, with the way they were sold. And what we found on the Banking Commission, and certainly with the Treasury Committee, is, is, is the, the mis-selling element. Because mis-selling is different from being sold a, a, a dodgy product. Being forced to be sold a, a perfectly uh, legitimate product in a bad way is also a crime. And, and where we've seen the real problem is when people have been told you, you can't have the loan unless you buy this, the, the, this interest rate product. Well, so we've had that tonight. Uh, absolutely right. And, that, and that's absolutely key to this. So what they've got to do is disaggregate what, what, what's been going on with the, with the, with the, with the compensation. Um, the problem is, of course, as I say, you know, my words a bit earlier, the, the banks are absolutely struggling like polecats in order to get away from actually taking responsibility for this. And, and this is something which, which I'm quite alarmed about, is this whole element of being told you don't have to go and get, get, get professional advice, and then actually you do have to get professional advice. And I'm very interested to hear what Foz has to say about this, actually, in terms of, in terms of, of, of coming in. But we'll come to that in a minute. John, I, yes. this business so, of the... Sorry, Andrew, can I just, yes. just pick mm. up on a point? Because... It's, it's in some ways it's a fair comparison to say when you want to fix your mortgage because you, that, there can be a lot of advantages to fixing your mortgage. But I don't think, I think that's half the story. I mean, I, I've spoken to, to a couple of people tonight and, and some people have said that they've been, they were offered a 10-year swap when they had a five-year loan. Yeah, absolutely. And people, and, so that, so that's, not, that's not matching, that's, that's just wrong. And similarly, where the, where the loan is on is the the customer is obliged to pay capital and interest, so the amount of the loan comes down, but the swap contract is based upon the original amount. Mm -hmm. So this is not a, this is a, is very misleading to say it's it's no, there's no matching that's gone on, mm -hmm. and that's a complete misselling. It's totally wrong. But John, I was going to ask this business of these embedded products. The people who who took the embedded products with the, they were embedded in the loan agreement, how much did they know about what was embedded in the agreement? Well, I think you probably wanted to direct that question to, uh, to Scott, actually, because in terms of um, our role, we're not so close to what happens in terms of the actual contractual side. We pick things up after the, the, the stage one redress on okay, that. So well I, think, I feel if I could Scott? give that perhaps to Scott. Yeah, in, in most cases, uh, you know, very little, because again, especially with, with some products that certain banks had that were aimed at the small, small business market. I mean, you know, basically, they, they created their own names for something that was, we meant a structured collar, that were, and they were deemed toxic right away. Well, let's not call it a structured collar, let's call it a discounted fixed rate range loan, sign here. Mm. And, and that's it. And that, 
by the fact that they, they did that, it's not viewed as a derivative product. Therefore, these people have, are not, you know, are not in the review because it's not viewed, you know, an analogy, you know, they put lipstick on a pig and manage to sneak it by the regulator. So it would be perfectly possible for an ordinary um, borrower to have taken a loan with one of these products embedded in it mm -hmm. and they didn't really know it was there. I would say it was more likely than not. More likely yes. than not, yes. yes. Yeah, Andrew, we're just emailing all of our members to find out about just how serious this bit is because we've actually not had the evidence coming forward on the embedded swaps that could be another whole ball game that needs to be looked at in cool. some depth once we've got the evidence that these are in normal loans to give it that sort of technical comment from a, a, a lay point of view. Um, but it really is totally, totally wrong that businesses have been put in this position, businesses have been put out of uh, businesses we've just heard. You know, who would imagine that a butcher wanting to do property uh, has to be sold something like this and goes out of business because of it. That is just not on in this day and age. And I come back to PPI, I also come back to LIBOR, I come back to Forex, which is now being looked at. Mm. This has got to stop to restore trust and confidence in the banking system. It really has, and I'm afraid Parliament has got to take steps, if nobody else will, to deal with this, because although we've had good conversations with Treasury, we've had good conversations with Biz, we have good conversations now with the FCA going forwards, but nobody seems to be really taking action hard enough to sort this problem out. Caroline, does the, the Ombudsman have any role in this? Yes, I mean, we, we, see, uh, we do see some cases. I mean, we uh, only see actually quite a small proportion because of the limits of our jurisdiction. So we can only look at complaints from small businesses who've got less than 10 employees and a turnover of less than 2 million euros. So that means that we've actually only seen a few hundred cases, really, in relation to this issue. Um, but certainly for the cases we have seen, we've seen and experienced a number of the issues that have been highlighted already this evening. Have you succeeded in getting redress for anybody who's complained to you and brought their case to you? We have. We've made awards in favour of customers. We published some of our early decisions. You make the awards? We made the awards. So, so we will... And then do you get the money back from the bank? Indeed. So, so the Ombudsman will decide what the Ombudsman thinks fair compensation is mm. in a particular case. I mean, one of the other constraints we have, though, is that our award limit it's means that we can only 150,000 now, yeah. So obviously, in some cases, that means that we can make an award up to that amount, but then we can just make a direction mm. as to the rest, and, and that's the limit to what we can do, yeah. So and but, I just ask a question yes. on that? How many times, you know, if you make a, a suggestion to the bank, you know, is it more often than not that they follow your suggestion, or do they, you know, stonewall it? Not, it's a mixed bag, I think. I mean, I think that what sometimes happens then is that the bank will then want to talk to the individual business and have a discussion about actually the different ways in which they can receive compensation. And sometimes those things will be beyond that which we can have awarded. And that may be in the interests of the individual business. So, um, so it's a mixed bag, really. But since you're billed as the, uh, the, the defender of consumer rights up against financial misdemeanors by big financial institutions, doesn't this whole thing show that you are, you, you lack the powers and the scope uh, and the enforcement that you should have to matter? So we, ha we have the enforcement and the scope we need within the boundaries of, of the complaints that we're able to deal with, which means, which at the moment is basically consumers as, as defined in MIFID. Now, the reason I think that our limit is as it is, and we don't set it, that's set by uh, the FCA. Um, is to do with the Ombudsman being an alternative to the courts, really. So we're intended to be an informal alternative, and so our procedures are not the same as court, you know, so it's not about people needing to have experts to, to come back to the point that I think Mark was uh, inviting me to comment on. Mm. So certainly for cases that come to the Ombudsman, we would not expect people to need um, the excellent, I'm sure, uh, advice of colleagues to the right, because actually the whole point of the Ombudsman for the cases we can handle is about us being able to level the playing field. But of course we can only do that within the confines of the, the jurisdictional powers we've been given. Well, would it be fair to say that given that, that you have really no more than a walk-on part in this scandal? We, we have a, a small section of what we, what we can do, yes. I mean, mm. you know, so, I mean, I think it was thought about, uh, well, it was thought about at different points whether mm. or not 
the Ombudsman should be asked to play a bigger role in the review and perhaps provide some additional um, appeal mechanism. And we thought about that and said, well, if people want us to, we'd be happy to consider mm. that. But it was decided that that wasn't appropriate, and so that's the limit to the role we can play. All right, thank you for that. Let's uh, throw this open to the audience now. We've got a microphone here, and there's another microphone at the back. Uh, I, I want to start off with Patrick Hegarty. Where's Patrick? There. Where are you, Patrick? Oh, r r right there. Because I, I wanted you, to, Patrick, just to say something, because you would like to bring in the so-called sophisticated investor into this redress pro process. Well, yeah, well, as I, as I touched upon earlier, the the arbitrary cap of 10 million pounds seems to be uh, illogical. I mean, it means that a product of nine and a half million, is the, the, the purchaser of the product is deemed to be sophisticated, but if someone is 10.2 million pounds, exact same product, suddenly they're sophisticated. It, it just seems... So the uh, definition uh, of sophisticated is is it is just as a numerical one. It's a size one. Uh, uh, no, sorry, no, Andrew. There's, there's various tests, but as soon as you hit 10 million, that's forget it, about that. Right. Like so if you've got 10 million, you're meant to be smart enough to deal with a trader from Barkat. Yeah, absolutely. Who's out to fool you and, and yeah. fill his boots. I, and what I would say as well is that, you know, you have the situation whereby, you know, in effect, we, we, we know what happened. So, so people, you know, like Patrick, are paying the price for, you know, aggressive bank lending. If they choose to lend you you know, thirty million pounds on a building, then you shouldn't be penal. If you're non sophisticated, you're non sophisticated. If you know Okay. Let me see some hands. There's a gentleman here and also if you've got one back there. Okay, I'll come to the one closer to the front first, then up to the back. Yes, sir. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Um Tony Groom, the focus has been on redress, and of course it's incumbent on the banks to minimise the redress, and so you might argue whether they've actually lost money on this. Um, I'd perhaps like to address the issue of, 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 a, of the culture. First of all, has a crime been committed, and where does sort of accountability, responsibility and liability actually lie if we are going to look at the culture that's caused this? Thank you for that question. Has a crime been committed? I'm not a solicitor, but I think within the de definition of the law, I understand that a crime's not been committed. I mean, um, I, I advise all the time on, on negligence cases, and if, mm. if something's genuinely been missold because it wasn't appropriate or wasn't explained or wasn't right for the client, there's, there's a, re a redress system. Whether you're now talking about something which is institutional, uh, and, and that, that, that changes the, the, the flavour on it because of all... Because they, they've got the, the Barclays have got, for example, have got their frontline bank managers who can see opportunities and they've done bank deals with Barcap. And whether that becomes uh, an endemic problem, uh, I, don't, I personally don't think it does become criminal, um, but th that is for the lawmakers to decide whether, whether or not it should be criminal. I think it should be part of a, a clear process. Well, well, let's ask a lawmaker. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the culture and the responsibility and who takes, carries account of this is absolutely crucial to, to what we've been doing in terms of the Banking Commission work. And then that is, that is, out of that has come the, uh, the Banking Reform Act, which was passed just before Christmas. Uh, the bottom line is, is this, is that there has been a huge problem with the senior managers of banks creating an accountability firewall between where they are and the front line of these banks. And we found this uh, as being quite, quite crucial to the, to, the, to the whole culture of banks. Well, that's how so the mafia behaves. The it, mafia it, boss absolutely. is never accountable yeah. to the ones on the ground. And that is absolutely what's behind the new rules that have been brought in. So the Banking Reform uh, Act uh, now, now specific, specifies named individuals at the senior parts of these banks who take responsibility for what's happening on the front line. And actually this now goes to the stage where, where should a bank fail, uh, now this is obviously an extreme example, but should a bank fail and taxpayers' funds are used to bail it out, that the, the assumption is now on guilt and that the people managing those banks will have face a prison sentence unless they can prove they took every measure to, to try and avoid the bank collapsing. But it's personal individual, individual accountability. And I think the point about this is that you know, what we want is people waking up in a cold sweat at 3 o'clock in the mm. morning thinking, I've done something wrong or there's something going on in my bank. That, um, that, that, that we're worried about. But one thing that worried me the other day was referring back to this Lloyd's thing, which I spoke about with this mis-selling. Mm. Uh, we had Martin Wheatley in front of the Treasury Select Committee the other day, and I was asking him about this very point, and he was saying, well, the managers of the branches 
we're asking these people to, we're giving incentive schemes, and therefore you couldn't uh, hold these individuals to account for mis-selling. To which I thought, actually, I answered, this, this sounds like a post-modern Nuremberg defence. I was only obeying my bonus mm. scheme. And, uh, and this is absolutely problematic. We still have to make sure the regulator is driving the responsibility absolutely from the individual who is speaking to, the, you know, to your account managers, all the way through the bar cap salesman, through the in middle managers, through the second line of defence, all the way up to the senior managers of this firm. There has to be a line of accountability, and this is what the Banking Reform Act is requiring, and this is now being put into place through the regulators. Mike, if this was in America, your members would have got together and mounted a massive class action lawsuit against the banks. Why hasn't that happened here? Uh, because we have only just been given that sort of power to be able to take the action with the FCA. Are you and, thinking about it? Uh, we are looking at the implications of that. Um, at the moment, though, as we've heard, it's predominantly micro-businesses that come under a lot of this scheme, and it's the big question about who is sophisticated, who is not sophisticated, whether you've got the embedded swaps that is still going to create a huge, huge problem, I think, going forward. What we need to be doing is really for the banks to be holding their hands up, just admitting that they've got it absolutely wrong, putting people back to the situation that they would have been in without linking it to existing loans or anything else. Mm. I think my, my real and concern... And are they linking it to existing loans? We believe that that is... Your members are telling you that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and a lot of them are wanting to remain anonymous, even though they may have redress. Because a, a lot of the people who, who've been missold want to remain anonymous... Even so the banks can pick on them. Absolutely. Gentlemen up at the back. Uh, post stage one redress, can you pursue a consequential loss claim and then if you fail on that, fall back to the flat rate interest compensation? Who would like to do that, John? Uh, yes, I, I'll deal with that one. I, I th my reading of from what I've seen from some of the banks, and I haven't seen all of the banks' uh, documentation on this, is that it typically says that if you go, if you if you pass up the the flat rate yeah. redress, and you want to go for consequential loss claim, and you get less under the consequential loss claim, you'll get less. It, you, you can't, you cannot bank that, and, and then try that, to get something and, better. And, and then try to get something better. So that's a difficult decision for people, then, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is, and it's what what worries me. It's not that it's just it's a difficult decision, but I, but with the cases that I'm dealing with, the banks are putting the the customer onto, a, onto very tight and often unrealistic deadlines to get their consequential loss claim in. And they seem, they're giving the impression that if, if it's not done within a timely manner, that you're going to be stuck with, um, with, with, either, with the, just the stage one redress. And, 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 that, and that's the problem. And, and what, I, what I would like, what Mark was saying, and I don't know if there's any en enforcement of this or any other experiences that people have had, is that it should be the case once once you've established that you've entitled the stage there has been the mis-selling you've got the stage one redress mm -hmm. we should be applying general legal principles which is what all the bank's literature says about the litigation well to prove the causation it takes time there should be there should be uh, uh, costs should be awarded for it because as we've heard from Karam, to prove that is does, is a difficult process but the banks seem to be applying the same stringent processes to stage two, even after they've been found guilty, as it were, and even after they've paid it, they're then hustling everyone to come into what may then be an inadequate claim, because as, as you say, Andrew, they might feel, well, I, I, I'm probably entitled to more, but if I, if I so want to roll the dice a little bit, then I'm, I might lose out. And the question is, wh why should they? I want to come back to Mark in a minute, but first of all, I want to hear some more people from the floor. You've got the microphone, sir, just before you begin, who, who else? You've got the microphone up there? Just choose someone up and towards the back and then I'll come there. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Asher from Shoesmith. Uh, just two observations. First, in terms of if there is an admission by a bank that they've missold, why can't you uh, have a system where there is a reversal of the uh, burden of proof, such that the bank has to prove that those losses have not been caused? Because if there's an admission that they've done something wrong, then shouldn't it be up to them? And there is a legal principle reverse burden of proof to show that what you're presenting to them has not been caused by their fault. 
second <laughs> in reference. That's a question for a lawyer, though, isn't yes, it? Really? It is. well, know, but it's, a, it's an interesting point. You, why don't I take yeah. that as a point? Uh, your uh, and your second point? The second point is you, you, the reference to people buying mortgages. Yes, we all buy mortgages, but when we buy a property, we go through lawyers and we're advised about the, the adequacy or otherwise of the mortgage. But from these examples, no one was giving independent advice, no one was having a cooling off period, and the salesmanship was, to some extent, over the top. And just going back to your example of a car salesman, if he sells a car that's been clocked, yes, it is a criminal offence. Uh, and you're in the red braces selling these highly sophisticated products which I suspect most of them who were selling didn't understand, is an example of people doing something wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that yeah. contribution. Sorry, can I just make a, a, just an observation on yeah. um, the second point? Is that, but I think one of the problems was at the time, um, and clients I speak to on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the banks, in a lot of their documentation, were saying, I suggest you seek independent advice. For these products, who could they go to? Who was qualified to give them? But Barca. Yeah, ex ex exactly. Who were actually qualified? The only people qualified to sell them were the banks. So who was qualified to give them advice? Mm. Gentleman up at the back. Yes, sir. Uh, Stephen Barker. Um, don't we find this discussion a little bizarre? Has anybody seen the agreement between the FCA and the banks which legislates for all these people's claims? Have you seen it? And is it in the public domain? Right. I, I, I get the feeling from your question that it's not. No, let's it's find not. out. Is it in the public domain, Mark? I'd be amazed if it wasn't. Um, but ha having said that, if you print up the entire rule book, I think it's 12 foot high. Some people so are saying here it's not. No, no, no. Is it not? Well, well, a, lot, a lot are saying it's not. Okay. Uh, can yeah. anybody but shed some light on that? Well, I, mean, yeah. just, I, I think the gentleman makes an excellent point because that's where suddenly, I think it was January last the year before, we suddenly found out that there was non-sophisticated, sophisticated, were introduced, there was 10 million caps, there was an agreement somewhere between the banks and the regulator that they would be allowed uh, to introduce Ms. alternative products. I've not seen it. Mr Wheatley appeared on the Panorama programme, yeah. was interviewed, declared that an agreement had been entered into between 11 banks, didn't name them all specifically, but I think we can find out who they are. The agreement placed a responsibility on the chief executive officers of all those banks to administer this process fairly <coughs> with the customers front and center of the process. Fine. Apply then to the FCA, which we have done, for a copy of that agreement. Because within that agreement, there ought to be rules. The whole system is rule-based. Mm. Uh, the FCA won't release it. Uh, I'm not going into the technicalities for that, but, but they're very good. Well, shouldn't we be seeking an FOI? I've yeah. done that as well, and, and, the how's that, and how's that we've going? gone to the Information Commissioner, and the Information Commissioner has backed the FCA, and it's a fine point of regulation under the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000 that information collected in a regulatory process is confidential. However, this agreement is effectively legislating for this process of compensation that all these people are facing. So, it's like playing a game of football, in my view. One side knows the rules, doesn't tell you. The referee knows the rules, he isn't telling anybody, and he's blowing the whistle on you, the team that has no idea what you're doing on the pitch in the first place. <laughs> will, uh, will you appeal against the uh, uh, Information Commissioner's ruling? Yes, you can go to the, well, sorry. No, no I know you can, but will yes, you? Uh, certainly not, absolutely not. Uh, who's paying for that? I'm up against the state. These people are up against the state. They're all publicly funded organizations. They have unlimited resource. Individuals, companies, those that have gone bust, those that have lost their businesses, those that are struggling to keep them afloat, there is no way at two, 300 pounds an hour they're going to get into a 12-month process with the possibility of costs being awarded against them. So it'll be a double whammy yeah, for I can them. understand. Bankruptcy faces them immediately on that point. And make no mistake about it, there's plenty of examples where the banks have forced people into bankruptcy upon losing a particular case. Okay, thank you for that. The gentleman there, if we get a microphone, keep your hand up, sir, so we can get to it, and the gentleman in the blue shirt. But the other gentleman there, if you keep your hand up too, we'll get a mic to you. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, I uh, have the dubious privilege of being um, in administration and sophisticated. Aren't I a lucky one? Uh, my business ran for 20 odd years and I had to enter into structured cap and collars. I had no choice. The bank forced me to do this in 2006. Condition of the loan. When interest rates fell and they fell to half a percent, I had to pay £26,000 a month penalty interest. I appeared on Panorama programme as well. I had to pay £26,000 a month and I did that for three and a half years. I was then deemed a risk by Barclays and they therefore increased the lending rate to me by another 1%. So that cost me another £7,000 per month. Naturally, the business started to struggle. We did everything we could. We were told we had to uh, dispose of property. I disposed of property to the value of £1.4 million. Out of that £1.4 million, I was not allowed to use any of that money to exit the swap. Barclays forced me, forced me into a new loan on demand and they refinanced my business to the tune of £7.7 .7 million and they charged me £77,000 for that privilege. One week later, they called in the administrators. Now, I'm sophisticated. I had a pub business and I had in excess of 50 people working for me as the pubs run seven days a week. Now, I can have 50 people working for me for four hours a week cleaners, whatever they are, and pay £6.31 as a minimum rate, and I'm sophisticated. Yet I can have 49 people working for me and pay them £1,000 a week, and I'm not. Now, I've lost a small fortune. Mm. When we entered into the uh, swaps, the equity in our business was around £4 million. We employed people, which I think is what governments actually want businesses to do, grow business, and as a result of that, I've suffered, and I've suffered massively. The stress and strain on me and my family has been absolutely colossal. And nobody up there really understands that. And the government minister, as I said at the House of Commons three weeks ago, said to, said to me, we're listening to you. No, you're not. I don't believe for one minute you are. Can I ask you, where are you now in seeking a redress? I don't qualify for redress because I'm sophisticated, because I employ so more So you've just lost? I've lost everything. I have jobs no... Have, jobs have been lost? 60 people lost their jobs permanently. The administrators okay. have sold properties on. Needless to say, they don't seem to have made the uh, valuation figures that were placed on the uh, premises by the bank 12 months previously. The, How strange. Mark Garnier, when you listen to these stories... I mean, everybody here is obviously no doubt about how they've been let down by the banks and often misled and traduced by the banks. But should they not also have a feeling that they have been failed by the political system as well? Yeah, I think they should. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and if they have, what are you going to do about it? Well, there's a, there's a lot we're trying to do about it. I mean, bear in mind that, you know, as members of parliament, we're not representing the government, we're representing you against the government. You know, the Parliament holds the government to account, and I think that's an important thing to remember. You know, we are doing a great deal about it. Through the Treasury Select Committee, we're pushing very, very hard on this. And actually, I will take up the gentleman's point about the, uh, this agreement letter. And actually, the rules are in place. But I'll find out. You know, if you're having problems about this, we'll get on to the, to the, the regulators and find out what that agreement is. Well, we'll shouldn't the published. Treasury Select Committee ask to see the agreement. Absol absolutely. And then publish it on your a website. Absolutely. That's, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we weren't aware there was one, but, it, but look, I mean, you know, we're, we're hearing, can I, can hearing these... Can sorry, I also yeah. point out, sorry, mm. that yeah. the exit fee for me to get out of the swaps, A, was priced in American dollars, which is very interesting, from Barcap, mm. but the exit for me to get out of the swaps, with still four years running, was £949,000, mm. which Barclays included in the 7.7 .7 million and a week later so a, mil a million pounds a million pounds and a week later so i mean mark you're not the government you're quite right but you have told us you're very close to the man in the government yeah. who uh, is responsible for this i mean what action might we expect what action might we expect on embedded 
what, what action might we expect from the F of government putting more pressure on the FCA of extending the time? Because I understand there's about to be a, this is time limited. Yes. Yeah, there is. Well, well they're, they're, they're meant to be getting a whole lot of the redress schemes organized by the end of, I think it's May this May, year, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So there's, the, the, that, that's when the, the expectation of this being delivered is, is you know, the time limit. But uh, we're not entirely certain it's going to happen. Look, we, we, well, we are very angry about this. I mean, don't, don't underestimate how angry we are. We are doing our level best to try to put pressure on the regulator. And no, of course we are. Of course we are. Look, I mean, you know, I have co constituents who are losing businesses as well. And this, these aren't hollow words. I mean, I can't, you know, sort of standing in, 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 in a room like this sort of trying to convey actually how seriously we take it. This is absolutely, completely and totally wrong. But does the government, in your knowledge, have any plans to do more about this? The is there, was there anything in the Queen's speech? I don't think so. I mean, the coalition's got nothing no, to do the these days, so you've got plenty of time to change the law here if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, and we I mean, have. you're all going home on Wednesday nights from the Commons these days. Andrew, we I can't get anyone to appear on my show on Thursdays because you're all back at your constituencies. <laughs> I'll, uh, uh, I'll come along. I'm very happy to. So you well, I'll hold you to, uh, to that. And I think we might talk about this too. No, you're absolutely right. Look, the, 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 the regulator is, is, is independent, uh, and that is part of the statute of the regulator. Now, there's a number of reasons why that is. Um, and having looked at this quite in quite a depth in terms of the, 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 the Financial Services uh, Act that went through, which created the regulator, actually it's not such a bad thing, because sometimes you don't want uh, members of parliament interfering on an ongoing basis with the regulator, because actually you would get so much regulatory uncertainty it would be even more difficult. Uh, because we all think we know what we're doing, and actually, quite often we don't. Um, the, the, the point is, Parliament is is there to hold the regulator to account. You know, we get Martin Wheatley to come in, and we sit there and we grill on the Treasury Select Committee. Now, you know, admittedly, that's only kind of three hours once every six months, but we do drag them in front of us. We do have committees and panels and all this kind of stuff, and we, you know, rough them up. To a certain extent, our problem is that we don't necessarily, you know, have the expertise, for example, as some of the other people on this panel. But we don't want the regulator to get it wrong. We don't want businesses to go bust. We don't want people to be legged over by their banks. Actually, what we want is you know, the economy to be successful. We want businesses to lend to successful businesses and make them even more successful. We don't want these problems to happen. So we are doing what we can, but we have to do it to a certain extent in the confines of, of the laws as they are bedding down. But having but just I understand them. all that, but it's kind of a general bromide, isn't it? Uh, what I'm trying to get is that there are clearly, from listening both to experts up here and down there, and people who've suffered, people who've done the right thing, people who are doing what politicians are always asking them to do, yeah. which is take a risk, be entrepreneurs, yeah. invest in the country, create jobs. Yeah. They've done all that, and look what it's got them. What I'm trying to get from you is, is this it? Is this all the government's going to do? Is the government not going to change the laws? Is it not going to get tougher? Is it not going to get the FCA to get its act together? What are you going to do? Keep the pressure up from Parliament on the regulator. The government but it's has, not working for these people. But the government has changed the rules. Bear in mind, since, since this happened, so this is all a pre-crisis uh, mis-selling. So that was, goes back to prior to 2008. What has happened since then is the, the regulator has been changed. You have new bodies within the Bank of England to look at exactly this type of thing. The banks are being reformed. To uh, the personal sure. accountability. I, I understand all that. I'm glad that's a bit. For, mm. for a lot of people here, that's a too classic late. case it's of bolting the door after mm. the, the, the horse is. Sorry, closing the door after the horse is bolted. Mm. There's a gentleman there, if we can get a microphone to him, in the second mm. row. And there's a gentleman here. If you just keep. Here he is, if we can see. Hello. The oh, there's someone there. All right, well, after you've got that, we'll get it over to him. I'll go to you next and then I'll come to you. Um, Simon Bruce, um, we've got visibility through our forum of 100 redress scheme outcomes. By our forum you mean? Um, the Bully Banks Forum. You're, you're representing the... Uh, we're not representing Bully Banks but we're on the, we're, you're on we're, the, we're, we're right. on the forum. The um, problem is it looks like a bit of a lottery. If you bank with HSBC, you've got a 94% chance of a reasonable outcome. Mm. If you bank with Barclays, an 88% chance. If you bank with RBS, a 77% chance. However, if you bank with Lloyds, only a 47% chance. Now, the same salespeople, I've written to the FSA on a number of occasions on this, and they say, well, there are differences between um, the populations of the banks. 
and the way they sold the products. Mm. But that's not the case. I mean, there's one sales guy who was at HSBC. <clears throat> he missold two um, swaps to people we know. He then moved to Lloyd's. He sold swaps to me. And now he's gone back to HSBC. So do you think he changes the way he sells as he moves from bank to bank? I doubt Very. it. He also wasn't FCA registered when he, or FSA at the time, registered when he sold the swaps when he was at HSBC in the first place. So, you know, it's not an even review. The, 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 the independent reviewers are not um, operating, and the F FCA are not operating an even uh, redress very, scheme. Very interesting. Let me go yeah, to can, John. Can I just make a comment on that? Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm no lover of the banks, but those statistics you just quoted can have an entirely different spin on them, which is that HSBC's original selling was hopeless and that Lloyd's was actually not so bad. Mm. So I don't think it's fair to just to say that because the, the numbers were like that slew with the banks, that means it's not a level playing field, because it may be entirely different in terms of the procedures that they went through internally within the banks about how they did. And, and okay, I that, that's, that's fair enough. What's your answer, your answer can I just, to just, just, sorry, oh, Hold on, let me just get an answer to that, and then I'll, co I'll come to you, Scott. I think probably because Lloyd's shares are coming up for sale later on this year, that Lloyd's are adopting a very, very, very high bar. Um, to avoid provisions that are too high that might spoil you their the, share sale. You mean they're building up their balance sheet? Yeah, yeah. Scott? Yeah, no, just, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting statistic and not something that surprises me at all. Um, I would have to disagree with John and say the cases I look at, I don't think there's any bank that can say it had sales standards. I think the difference being, and certainly this is from what I hear, I, bearing in mind the banks employed a whole army of people like me, my former colleagues, in Canary Wharf with uh, on very nice day rates, I may say, but the fact is that there was no bank that had a clean bill of health. HSBC, in my opinion, from the cases I see day in, day out, have said, look, we're a big bank, we have the fewest, let's deal with this and move on. And they have the strongest balance sheet. Exactly. Let's deal with this, move on. And the other banks, for example, um, Lloyd's in particular, they are, you know, there's a whole, without boring with technicalities, there's this whole 7.5% rule. They are using everything they can to reduce the amount of redress. And I would say that that's what I see on a day, day, out, day in, day out basis. Well, Scott, when you deal with the banks, can you, do you see a, a, a league table of, uh, from banks that put their hands up and say it's a fair cop, gov, let's settle, to those that say we did nothing wrong and we're not uh, helping you at all. Yes, but I think, I think there's, to sort of answer your question, there's two league tables. There's the, um, dare I say it, there's the Scottish Premier League and there's the English Premier League. The, um, so there's a big difference between the two. Yes, leagues, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Is there still um, a Scottish Premier League? Yeah, yes, yes. Does it not get done under the Trades Description Act for calling yourself <laughs> Premier? Well, it will do. My, my team's about to exit, so I wouldn't have... <laughs> um, no, Sorry, how you going? Yeah, no, I, I think that the, you know, the difference being that you know, I could have guessed those numbers. Not the numbers, but what, what I meant by the two different leagues is there's one for smaller cases, and I could tell you roughly what the percentage I would guess with the smaller cases are. Where those figures will be skewed, and this is what we've yet to see, all the big cases, or most of the big cases that we, certainly I'm involved in, they have not been settled yet. Mm. And it's only when we see how they're going to deal with the significant ones. There's one thing saying, look, this is a relatively small mm. one, let's deal with this. There's a very worrying trend that we've just seen over the last week, and this has come out from Barclays. Now, up till now, Barclays haven't been too bad. You know, if you look at the... the, the, the they've been uh, settling 88% as reasonably good outcomes. But suddenly, they've started putting out, on a swap-for-swap -swap basis, nine-year swaps. Yeah. And again... I would suggest that's because now we're getting to the, the more difficult ones for them. And John, do, do you see, when you're dealing with the more uh, difficult, the more extensive losses that you're trying to get back beyond the redress stage one, do you see a, a, a different uh, reactions, different performance from the banks when you're trying to do this? I'm too early in the cycle. Really? It's that, yes, er yes, it's that early for this? It is, because as we found out here, no, nobody's had any feedback at all from the banks in relation to oh, any On your first question. Yeah. Yes, that's why I wanted to gauge the, where, where we okay. were in the sausage machine. And my, my part of the sausage machine is there. A lot's gone in, but we're not getting anything back. 
So okay. that, that's how I'm reading it. Interesting. So there's a lot to come up. Mike? Yeah, Andrew, I think there's one really fundamental issue here, and that is that when the FSB first put forward a case for this to be looked at in some depth, we'd advocated independence, total independence around all of this. It didn't happen. It stayed with the bank. We've got independent reviewers who are trying, I suspect, to be independent reviewers, but they work within the banks in some way or another uh, in association. And I, so just explain, what would you like to have, uh, have happened? Th this should have been totally outside of the banks. Mm. Absolutely totally outside of the it banks. It should have been an independent third party. Well, yes. And the problem there is that there is no appeals process either within this whole process uh, at this moment in time. I think someone highlighted it earlier when they mentioned the figure of 40 billion. If that was put in as reserves against the banks, and we've heard figures of 10, I certainly hadn't heard of 40 before, that would have a huge, huge impact on the financial sector at this moment in time. All right, let me go to the gentleman up there. He's been very patient. He's got the mic. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Satish Chakral. Um, in 19, um, 2004, we were sold uh, three um, swap rate hedges, and uh, part of the sales pitch from the Treasury Department, the people who came to sell us these products of RBS, part of the uh, sale pitch was that we are protect these products will protect you against um, fluctuating interest rates. Mm. Now, English is not my first language, but fluctuating to me means up and down a downward movement of interest rates. And in this case, I'm afraid it has not protected me, but penalized me very, very heavily and continues to do so. Because in practice, it only could have protected you on, for rising interest rates. Yes. And didn't protect you on the downside. But the sales pitch was that it would protect you against fluctuating. Yes. Okay, this is point number one. The other thing is that we were uh, informed, I think something like 22 months ago, 21 months ago, that uh, we are qualified or non-sophisticated and the review process has started. To get any information on update is absolutely impossible. Uh, they seem to be a law unto themselves from that point of view. And I doubt very much if any of these banks will actually complete the whole process, uh, the, the review process, by the deadline set by the FCA, which is May uh, uh, 2014. This May? That's what I understand. So it's all kind of got to be done and dusted by this May? Yeah. That's what I understand. That's that's what not, I understand. From what I've heard tonight, that's not going to happen, is it? No, I don't think so at all. I don't think so. So that's another problem that we will face. Uh, finally, I'd like to express an opinion that I think this government is doing absolutely nothing. It is toothless. It, I'm talking about RBS situation here because it owns 80% of the bank and yet it cannot influence or make any positive policies or directions at all in, in, in terms of this review process. Thank you for that. The gentleman there. And then we'll get a um, microphone to the gentleman in front in the red tie and the grey suit, I think it is. Yes, Aidan Briggs. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a barrister, and a lot of the cases that I deal with, um, which have been touched on in the examples that we've heard from so far, is where businesses are classified as distressed by the banks with whom they're dealing. And that then alters the terms on which the banks deal. They either increase margins, a lot of them will, will impose... A, uh, a financial controller at the client's expense or they'll impose an accountancy exercise at client's expense. Now, um, Lawrence Tomlinson recently reported on this issue and I was really wondering um, from Mark's point of view whether there was any appetite to address the recommendations he made in his report. Mark. Yeah, very, very important question. The, um, the, the Lawrence Tomlinson report, um, we asked him to come before us in the Treasury Select Committee. and. I think he was sort of slightly surprised that this, this report had taken sort of so much, uh, you know, kind of media attention. Um, it was, it, it's, it's interesting because he admitted that actually it was not very scientifically compiled. It was put together through sort of anecdotal evidence uh, rather than any sort of formal evidence gathering process. And that, um, that actually it was quite a small number of people he was talking about. However, and this is the important point, is that the, this is a story that resonates with so many members of parliament. Every single member of parliament at, at, at countless, countless surgeries that we hold will have met businesses that are being stressed like this uh, by banks. And it is a big problem. So the Financial Conduct Authority has, uh, has, has conducted an investigation against it. I had a conversation with Ross McEwen about this the day it was published to ask him about it. And it was quite interesting, his answer. He, um, he said... 
He said, we are not institutionally going out and trying to screw customers. However, he said, I would be surprised if within the organization that we have like uh, RBS, that if this has not happened. So he admits that there's potentially these problems in there. The, and, um, and did he tell you what he's going to do about it? Yes, they've, 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 they're spending a huge amount of money. I can't remember the, sol the solicitor who's come in, but they have got in a solicitor under a Section 166 uh, investigation. Um, so the Section 166 investigation is where the, um, the regulator uh, effectively uh, engages a lawyer to come in and do a thorough uh, internal audit of what's been going on. They set the terms of reference. The bank has to pay the money, so it's, it's a standard procedure. And there will be a formal report that will be produced from that. From our point of view on the Treasury Committee, we've obviously met with Tomlinson. We didn't really get more than we were expecting from him. Mm. But when the regulator reports on this, we will then get them back again. But it, you know, this, this, this ongoing stuff and looking at the banks is carrying on from the uh, Banking Standards Commission. And it's, for us, it is incredibly important that we really get to the bottom of this and find out whether it is just the odd rogue banker, which is still disgraceful when it happens to one company, it's disgraceful, or whether there is institutional um, it was systemic. Whether it's systemic, exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is James Ritchie. Um, I'm an interim um, third round and restructuring professional, um, primarily a big four background through my career, but um, I've spent a lot of time working with owner-managed businesses on the company side of the table. Uh, my first point is that, um, well, two points. First point is that the redress aspect is just far too slow. Mm. I have been working with a business for over two years, owner-managed care home. Um, it is banked with RBS. Um, they have been very constructive throughout. Uh, however, you know, the business is right on the brink today uh, and potentially the curtain is going to come down tomorrow. So time is of the essence. Yes, yeah, time is of the essence. It, we have pushed and we have pushed and we have pushed to get an output from the FCA review uh, process. So has the manager in GRG who has been incredibly cooperative throughout. There is a kind of like Chinese wall there. They can't get visibility into the case. It's been escalated to, you know, critical. Um, uh, the new money request uh, uh, to um, save the business and allow it to transition into a new business model would be outright funded and met, you know, by the redress. We're talking about over half a million pounds. Um, HMRC arrears uh, would uh, would just be settled completely. The owner has, I mean, basically, I get involved in businesses to go in to fix them and fix the problem. Ironically, um, we were watching the um, development of the FCA um, uh, guidance coming out, etc., and it became a stalling game. Um, and the owner has basically been able to keep the business afloat for up by, by us playing a stalling game with the bank. We've done some, a couple of short-term extensions of facilities, still nothing coming out of the FCA review, but it really is make or break time at the moment. And internally within RBS, they cannot, after almost 18 months, give an answer. And to pick up on John's point um, about um, uh, the, um, you know, in some cases, it, it ought to be fairly simple. Um, it was a five-year loan. It was a 20-year product. One was amortizing. The other wasn't. Mm. He never met a salesperson on the product. Mm. What's so difficult? What's so difficult? You know, and you know he's got five kids. He lost his wife. Mm. Um, you know, because she uh, she came down with cancer. You know, a lot of family stress. Mm. Um, so that's um, that's the first thing. There are lots of things being done. I'm sure that are good. You know, mm. and moving things in the right direction. But basic redress. Come on, it's got to happen mm. quickly. Okay. How can there be an excuse for something like that for it to take 18 months and we've done all of the right steps? Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Mm. Let me come um, to the gentleman in the in the front. That's, sorry, I, th I, I think you've quite a good one, good things. I, I just want sorry. this gentleman's been waiting a long while. I want to let him have the mic. Yes, thank you, sir. Andrew. Ali Akram from Lex Law Solicitors. Um, I want to step back a little bit and uh, think about this quite logically. Um, the banks have been mis-selling these products. It's happened in a period from 2005 to 2008. Was it that concentrated in that? Sort of that was the principal period that the, right. that the mis selling was happening. At Interest the height rates, of the boom. At the height yeah. of the boom. So, in that period, um, the amount of mis selling that happened and the cost consequences to these banks is estimated to be somewhere between 10 and 40 billion pounds. That's the real cost if proper address is given out. 
So if we look at the government, they're in a very difficult position, as in fact is the entire country, because if proper address is given on behalf of these four or five major banks that have been involved, we'll end up bailing out all of these banks again. And no government is going to do that. So that's not going to happen. This is why we have a flawed review scheme. It's flawed because of all of the reasons that have been aired here this evening. And so the reality is, as, these, as the victims of this mis-selling are going to realise, or have realised, is that they're in a competition for redress. That's the reality. So the ones that have taken, uh, protected their legal rights, and the legal rights in this country are flawed for victims, the legal rights in Ireland, in Germany, in France, are better, even though they're derived from the same European directive, MIFID. And they're flawed because of lobbyists that have persuaded the government not to ensure that the protections in this country are the same for example companies as they are for individuals. But people who've protected their legal rights are at a better chance of getting redress in the review than anyone else. And what I'd really like to ask is I'd like to ask Mark Warner to ensure that this confidential agreement that the FCA have reached with, their, uh, with the banks that they regulate which Martin Wheatley and the, the uh, Freedom of Information request and the ICO, that is not going to result in the release of this confidential agreement. However, as an MP and as a member of the APPG, you do have rights to demand documentation from banks and from the regulator. Now, one bank is 80% owned by the government, and that bank cannot refuse... I, I can send you a, a methodol methodology by which you can get a hold of this document <laughs> and let everybody see what this review scheme is. All right, let's, let, let's do um, Mark. I mean, I've agreed to do that already in the, the, the earlier point. Um, he sounds so, like he's got a key to the back door. Well, hopefully, hopefully the Treasury Committee's got a key to the back door, which is, which is we can ask that. Um, I mean, look, the, I wouldn't say that we have the right to every document and publish every single document. I mean, there, there are confidential documents out there which are confidential for various different reasons. But, this, this but well, we, we, no. we, we'll find out. But look, you know, what, what I have said is I'll, I'll do everything I can to try and get that out, and we'll, we'll use you know, Andrew Tarr and the Treasury Committee to try and do that. Is there not a suspicion that the FCA doesn't want this to become public because it could show up what the FCA has agreed? That it's, a, that it's become a victim of regulatory capture? The people Possibly. it's meant to be regulating, it's been captured by. Yeah. yeah. Why would but there's a a Nick, you wanted to say a word, I think. Mm. Yes. The, the mic will come on all right, don't right. It? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, just about the review scheme. I mean, I, I feel mm. that, you know, I was stitched up by the bank in 2007. I, I now feel I'm sort of stitched up by this review scheme because mm -hmm. I don't understand what it is that I can do to prove... It. You know, all the onus is on me to prove what I did. I haven't seen anything from Barclays about the recorded phone call that obviously took place in 2007. They haven't released me a transcript of me saying, yes, I love this product. And, you know, that, that hard sale. I haven't heard anything about, you know, any sort of inter-bank remuneration between capital and corporate and what their motivation is. I've asked loads of questions. And it's just a one-sided uh, uh, review. It's, it's what I knew. If they think that I was broadly happy with it, great. Off you go, Nick. It's, it's carrying on, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm stuffed. All right. Yes, go sure. Yeah, I just uh, having seen the transcript of uh, Nick's um, fact-find meeting, you know, it is clear that, you know, you don't have to be... Uh, you know, Philadelphia lawyer to work, when someone asks you the same question in six different ways, they're trying to get you to say something. And that was, that was what came over loud and clear. Mm. Uh, you know. And just one thing, just uh, Ali, what I'd, I'd just like to sort of chat, I'm not quite sure how protecting your legal position is going to affect the amount of redress that's, that's payable. I understand that it's, it's, you know, it's an, it's an important effort, but certainly, you know, I do, do not see how just protecting your position will have any bearing on the review. Okay, I can answer that question. Yeah, please. Just, just briefly, please. Okay, the, there's three ways in which a litigation leverage strategy in dealing with the review can assist. One, in uh, dragging information out of the banks. Two, in protecting the cost position. So any money you've spent in litigation and in the review of fighting the banks is likely to be 
uh, as a result of the rules with litigation to be paid by the winning party. So if you get redress, which yeah, is no, no, no chance within of getting, the redress, you know, just I was just to clarify, just within the redress scheme, you know, I don't, you know, I certainly know that they're not looking at right who's who's done this. They're purely, comp, you know, focusing on the sale of that product. Yeah. The, the other, I agree with you. That it brings why don't, in, you, why don't you, you have a, a conversation? Yeah, with, uh, we're going to have time to network. We're coming to the end, not immediately, but in the next couple of minutes. So I come to you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the name's Lawrence Tosh. Uh, my question is to Mr. Garnier. It relates to the fact he, his comments seem to tie in uh, the conditional sale of these products. Mm. Uh, in our case, it was, that was not the situation. I would like to say these products were not explained at all in a proper way. And I think this needs to be part of the mis-selling. They came to us saying, oh, protection against upward interest rates and all the rest of it. They were in possession of the long-term graph of interest rates, short-term in terms of months going up, long-term 10 years going down, not towards half, accepted mm. towards 4%. We are dealing fundamentally with fraud. And I think that word should be used and not hidden. I know it is more difficult to prove at court, I accept all the rest of it. But I think that is the fundamental culture we are dealing with. Secondly, I would also like to say in relation to the swap for swap which is going to grow far more in size as I am now in the car park of RBS awaiting their second review of us. If you have a car which is smashed up, uh, sorry, cl heavily clocked, you do not expect them to be forced into the sale and given an alternative car, you expect, you expect to get your money back. Thirdly, in relation to what Parliament can do, is that at present limited companies do not have right of court action for damages against for breaches of the uh, financial regulations. This is a draconian piece, it has no relation to anything, and if he's serious about what he wants to do to help remedy things, that is a, a basic piece of action he can take. Okay, thank as, you. as the limited companies abroad have the right of action, All in right. the UK they do not. We're uh, uh, coming to the end of our time here, but the panel will be here for a little while and there'll be some drinks at the back which we can go to at the minute. Can I just, uh, Scott, with you loop forward now? Because we have the, the shutters coming down in May, only two months away now. Mm -hmm. From everything we've had tonight, there is a massive unfinished business mm -hmm. and injustice rampant. What's going to happen? Well, I think that, you know, the, 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 the target date, and it is a target date, you know, it's, not, the, the, it's carefully worded. The banks have undertaken to have the initial redress outcomes out by the end of May. And but they've got a lot. I mean, I was looking at the figures. There's that, a lot Absolutely. I mean, I think that it works out that RBS would have to do one every, you know, 10 minutes or something like that. Yeah. So I think that that's going to... Uh, um, that target will be missed, but equally, just because the outcomes are out there, it doesn't mean that A, people are going to accept them, or B, be happy with them. So, it's a, they've said, we will inform you, but then there's still going to be a long way to go before, you know, even forgetting about John's side on the consequential loss. I mean, if we, you know, as we've said, no, hardly any consequential loss has been agreed so far. You know, that's just at the start of this process, so there's a long, long way to go. And there is, is there no more the Ombudsman can do? Well, as I said, I mean, not, we can only act within our existing jurisdiction. As I said before, I mean, one of the things that was considered before was whether that could be extended. And in fact, the FCA, I think, is going to consult later on in the year about whether to extend the Ombudsman's jurisdiction in relation to small businesses. So I'm sure a number of people here might want to respond to that consultation and then the FCA will, will consider that, yeah. And Mike, what's the FSB going to do next? Well, we will be continuing to lobby the FCA and ministers very, very hard on this one. We can only go on the evidence that our members are giving us. Um, but I think what clearly comes through on this is that not enough is being done. We've already seen, actually, that the, the first date that was anticipated for this procedure to be finished by has been missed. I think we will see the end of May very clearly being missed. And if embedded swaps comes through as being the next big issue, mm. then the government has really got to take mm. steps to act on this. Um, but apart from that, there's not a lot else that either ourselves or Boilie Banks or anybody else can do. All I just wish is that for those who are in this position, 
the banks would just hold their hands up and say, we've got it wrong, we're going to give you the full redress and call a quick, clear line under the whole issue because it is not restoring confidence, it is not restoring growth in the economy, it is losing jobs. And John, when do you, do you expect on the more complicated loss mechanism that you're working on, the, uh, 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 the cumulative losses, uh, when do you expect to see the first of these cases being reaching fruition? I think it's going to be uh, a, a little while yet, um, g given the state of our cases and other people that I've spoken to. I think it's going to take some time, um, probably several months yet, before we start seeing a, 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 a flow on this. And, and I'm very intrigued to know what's going to happen when, the, when it comes back with an, an inadequate offer in relation to what somebody thinks because we, we've used the analogy about the banks and being a, with football and, and analogy. Uh, the, the, I prefer the analogy of saying right now the banks are the, not only the defendants but they're also the judge and jury in relation to their own case mm. uh, and, and I think that's a, a, a that, it, it shouldn't be right but it mm. but that that's what that that is that's where we are at the moment and that and that's not right um, so I don't know what, what that process I was hoping with, with, there would be somebody here that may have been a little further down the line, but you, mm. what I found out today is how far down the line we are compared to everyone else, and, and there's n nobody seems to have got over got over that line yet. Last question, uh, very briefly. We put in consequential loss claims, and Barclays rang me and said, "Why are you bothering with this? Just take the eight <laughs> yeah, percent." I mean, that, and that's a serious problem where they're trying to persuade me on behalf of the client to, you know, and that's the worrying thing because we only deal with non-sophisticated customers okay so they're below the 6.5 right. million mark and, and the, the staffing level however one client we put in last week they had they had the payment sent back 125 grand the 8% was 30k but the consequence of the loss we put together is just under 300,000 whether we'll get it I don't know I think it's reasonable. Of course I do. All right. But that's the worrying thing. That's very interesting what you say there. Mark, finally, do you, will, will, will you go back to Parliament and will you speak to your mate, Sajid, mm. and tell him you're not doing enough? There are ordinary, decent, hardworking people who have become terrible victims mm. and that Parliament and the government needs to reconnect with these people and do something about it and stop the hot air and give us some action. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Andrew, there are two points. I mean, the first is Parliament is connecting, and that's why we have the all-party parliamentary group, and that's, that's a different thing from the government. But you're right, Andrew. You know, the, the, uh, the Treasury, which is the government part of it, does need to, to, to engage. And, and the figures, as of the 28th of February, say three weeks ago, uh, there were 18,808 uh, cases which were assessed as uh, non-sophisticated, so they were going into the process. 3,430 of those have been, have been paid out. Uh, it is just simply not good enough, and, and, and we agree with this. This is why Parliament is doing everything we can to work on your behalf to make sure the government does the right thing. It's partly the Treasury, but it's also the regulator, and we continue to put the pressure on the regulator to make sure this happens. All right, we need to... to, to can, I, can I just add one final point yes. on that? It's not just the first stage redress, but there's got to be pressure on the banks not to hustle the clients once th when they want to think about how they want to deal with the consequential loss claims because we're finding that the banks are putting the customer under a lot of pressure to get in these quickly and it's mm. exactly the same that that gentleman there says mm. it, it, that the banks are trying to hustle their way through because they just want the simple redress because it's it's much less and they need to be told that it, it's if we're following general legal principles then the claims got got to make their case within a time frame but not not days it should be months we can continue the debate on a hashtag uh, swaps debate. We thank uh, Veritas and uh, Franco for putting this on tonight. It's been, I think, a fascinating discussion. Thank all of you for coming, and I hope things get better. <coughs> and a uh, round of applause to our panel.